Welcome to Navarra Live. I'm Michael Walker. I'm joined by Ash Sarkar. Ash, how are you doing? I'm good. As ever in a chaotic world, these Monday nights with you are my North Star, Michael. <laughs> the structure you need in your life. I have to say your background is really, um, so. is really coming together. It looks very lived in now, much less bleak than it once was. <laughs> Well, look, we've got a plant supplied by my housemate, Rory. So big up Rory. He was like, the dying one in there was ugly. And now we have a cushion for lumbar support because I'm mm. in my 30s. Yeah, cushion's very important. Although your fur, your, your fur is, I'm not quite sure that's an excuse yet. Um, coming up later tonight, BBC Verify published their analysis of the so-called flower massacre that killed over 100 Palestinians last week. A hard-right former Labour MP has some terrifying recommendations for Rishi Sunak, and the price of train tickets has been hiked across the country, while Sadiq Khan has frozen them in London. Israel's assault on Gaza has now entered its 150th day. In that time, over 30,000 Palestinians have been killed in the territory, more than a third of them children. That's one in every 70 Palestinians in the Strip. A further 8,000 people are missing, many believed to be trapped under the rubble of homes, schools and other buildings targeted by Israel. 350,000 residential buildings have been destroyed or damaged, as well as nearly 400 education facilities. That's the context in which, for the very first time, a senior member of the US government has called for an immediate ceasefire. This was Vice President Kamala Harris speaking at an event in Alabama on Sunday. Given the immense scale of suffering in Gaza, there must be an immediate ceasefire. For at least the next six weeks, which is what is currently on the table. This will get the hostages out and get a significant amount of aid in. This would allow us to build something more enduring to ensure Israel is secure, and to respect the right of the Palestinian people to dignity, freedom, and self-determination. The deal that Harris referred to there is currently being discussed in Cairo by Hamas officials and mediators from the US and Qatar. Egyptian state media has reported, quote, significant progress towards a six-week truce before the month of Ramadan, expected to begin on Sunday. This was confirmed by a U.S. official who said that Israel had, quote, more or less accepted its terms. But Israel is boycotting the latest round of talk, saying that Hamas has failed to answer two questions. First, which hostages remain alive in Gaza? And second, how many Palestinian prisoners Hamas wants released in exchange for each hostage? This may be the normal back and forth of peace negotiations, but there are also signs that Israel's stalling could be less about the terms of the deal and more about Benjamin Netanyahu's ailing leadership. U.S. politicians tend to be pretty mealy-mouthed about the scale of Israel's brutality in Gaza, but in a sign that Washington's patience with Netanyahu's government might be wearing somewhat thin, Harris had some fairly strong words of criticism. What we are seeing every day in Gaza is devastating. We have seen reports of families eating leaves or animal feed, women giving birth to malnourished babies with little or no medical care, and children dying from malnutrition and dehydration. As I have said many times, too many innocent Palestinians have been killed. And just a few days ago, we saw hungry, desperate people approach aid trucks simply trying to secure food for their families after weeks of nearly no aid reaching northern Gaza. And they were met with gunfire and chaos. Our hearts break for the victims of that horrific tragedy and for all the innocent people in Gaza who are suffering from what is clearly a humanitarian catastrophe. Harris was referring there to last week's flower massacre in which 117 Palestinians were killed and over 700 injured after Israeli troops reportedly opened fire on a crowd trying to access aid. 
Afterwards, reports circulated that Joe Biden had refused a call from Netanyahu, something the Israeli Prime Minister's office denies. What it can't deny, though, is that Biden's administration now appears keen to do business not with Netanyahu, but with the popular leader of his main opposition party, Benny Gantz, leads the centre-right National Unity Alliance and is a member of Netanyahu's free member war cabinet. He is in Washington today to meet with senior US officials, including Kamala Harris, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. And it's now been confirmed that Gantz and the Americans planned the trip behind Netanyahu's back. That's a fact that has left the Prime Minister fuming, according to the Times of Israel. And there's a further sign of instability at the centre of Netanyahu's government. Israeli media has reported that senior officials in the army's spokesperson team have resigned over the direction of the country's war in Gaza. According to Israel's Channel 14, the resignations include chief spokesperson Daniel Hagari, second in command, along with at least three other high-ranking officials. Defections within Israel might be welcome, as are the Americans distancing themselves from Netanyahu. What's clear, though, is that this is way, way too little, and it's way too late. The BBC published this distressing report on Sunday. A truce can't come soon enough. In Rafa, another day of harrowing loss. Palestinians mourn for 20 members of the Abu Ansa family. Killed in their beds by an Israeli airstrike, according to hospital officials and Gaza's civil defence. Among the dead, five-month-old twins, as old as the war, Naim and Wissam, laid down gently with their relatives. Their mother, Rania, spent ten years trying to have them and endured three rounds of IVF. Now all she can cradle is their baby clothes. I gave birth during the war, she says. It started on Saturday. I gave birth the next Friday. I didn't get enough of them. I swear, I didn't get enough. I have no one else, she says. They've gone with their father. We were sleeping, I swear. Israel continues to say it takes feasible precautions to lessen civilian harm. There were about 35 people in the house, says Farouk Abu Anza. Most of them children. There were no fighters. The house collapsed on them, three or four stories. The children discussed in that report were killed by airstrikes, but we've long been warned as many could be killed in a possible future famine. And deaths from hunger are already being reported. UNICEF released this statement on Sunday. The child deaths we feared are here as malnutrition ravages the Gaza Strip. At least 10 children have reportedly died because of dehydration and malnutrition in Kamal Adwan Hospital in the northern Gaza Strip in recent days. There are likely more children fighting for their lives somewhere in one of Gaza's few remaining hospitals, and likely even more children in the north unable to obtain care at all. These tragic and horrific deaths are man-made, predictable, and entirely preventable. In a bid to be seen as responsive to such concerns, the United States has begun airdrops of aid into Gaza. This footage shows an airdrop of food aid from US and Jordanian planes on the Gazan coast. The Americans said the planes dropped the equivalent of 38,000 meals. That might make for dramatic images, but with 2 million people in Gaza, the airdrops are both figuratively and literally just a drop in the ocean. Ash, we are very clearly, I think, seeing a change in tone from the United States in the way that they talk about Israel. I suppose two things to say about, you know, I've said it already, too little, too late. One, um, sort of saying, oh, we, we'd like to see a sort of different, a different attitude from the Israelis is, you know, it's, 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 it's a bit pathetic, really, when they're still transferring them weaponry. Um, and then two, I suppose, how late it is, we're already literally seeing children starving to death in the Gaza Strip. Well, firstly, when it comes to the question of leverage, the United States has persistently 
refused to exercise what leverage it does have, which is the vast quantities of military aid it signs over to Israel every single year. Joe Biden bypassed Congress for the first big package of military aid, which went out to Israel towards the beginning of this war. And of course, while there was an organized form of um, opposition uh, you know, within the Senate, led by Bernie Sanders, there was another past package of military aid to the tunes to the tune of billions of dollars. Um, so all of this sort of pearl clutching and hand wringing and virtue signaling, quite frankly, it's for the birds because what we know is that America does have the power to force Israel to take a substantively different approach to its war on the Palestinian people. And it doesn't use the power that it does have. Instead, what you've got is this, I was heartbroken to see children killed. Killed by who, Kamala? Killed by who? Killed by the Israeli army that you help arm. So it's it's complete nonsense. And I think the only reason why we're seeing it is because of domestic political pressures. You saw the success of the undecided campaign in the Michigan Democratic Caucus. So the number of people registering themselves as undecided voters, it by far and away outweighs the majority that Joe Biden has in Michigan. So it's a way of exerting domestic political pressure and trying to force a different response from the Democratic administration. So You've got a change in tone, but the content simply isn't there. Um, what's interesting to me is the way in which uh, domestic Israeli politics is now playing out. So you've got Benny Gantz cutting Netanyahu out of his interactions with uh, the American government. And I think that that signals something which we've known for quite a while, which is this war on Gaza has been an extension of Benjamin Netanyahu's political life. He was already coming under fire for his very unpopular reforms to the Israeli Supreme Court. And also the security failures of October 7th are very much um, being pinned on him. And then, of course, on top of that, you've got the protests being led by the families of the hostages saying you've essentially let them die. You've let our hostages die because you would prefer to carry out your military objectives and prolong a war which will keep you in government. Now, when it comes to Benny Gantz, sure, he's a member of a centre-right party, but this shows you how extreme the mainstream of Israeli politics is because Benny Gantz is someone who's in favour of annexing portions of the West Bank, um, the occupied territories which, which you know, belong to a future Palestinian state. He's in favor of annexing those parts which have got a high density of Israeli settlements. So that's your mainstream political figure in Israel. Benny Gantz is still extreme when you look at international law and the sort of, you know, pervasive culture of Israeli impunity. He's just not as extreme as the likes of, you know, Bezalel Smotrich, um, you know, Netanyahu and others within his cabinet. Um, so so I certainly wouldn't see him as any sort of, you know, return to a viable peace process. It would perhaps be a slower process of ethnic cleansing for the Palestinians were Benny Gantz to uh, assume power and become prime minister. I certainly wouldn't expect Benny Gantz to have any kind of progressive policies whatsoever towards the Palestinians. I suppose the difference you might see, so at the moment, you know, I, I think you could argue that sort of Netanyahu's policies are to some degree irrational, even from the sort of national interest of Israel perspective, because he needs this war to continue to continue his career. Um, if Benny Gantz were to get into power, you would still have a war on the Palestinians, right? Continuing in, you know, completely unrepentant fashion. I think you would have the the Israelis falling into line with the Americans, and it would be a sort of uh, a more. I mean, it's a strange, strange um, sort of sequence of words, but a sort of less chaotic, slow motion genocide. I mean, that's what we're talking about here, right? It's going to be appalling. Whoever is in power in Israel, which is we come back to this all the time, precisely why the idea that we should wait for moderates to get control in Israel is ridiculous. What you need is sanctions 
on Israel. What you need is to boycott Israel. What you need is maximum diplomatic pressure on Israel, right? Because the idea, oh, no, Netanyahu is not going to last that long anyway. Let's just wait for a moderate to take charge. Uh, boycotting Israel, that would be very divisive. No, we should just, we should just cross our fingers and hope that a moderate comes into power who wants to return to the peace process. Not going to happen, right? Which is precisely why the only hope for any kind of um, viable Palestinian state for you know the end of a slow motion genocide is external pressure. It's not going to happen from within. You know, when in the era of apartheid South Africa, if someone t- you know if you said do you support sanctions on South Africa or boycotts of South Africa, and they said no, 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 we're just going to f- cross our fingers and encourage the moderate white people in apartheid South Africa to to bring about some moderate reforms. We're sure they'll do that, even if we still send them arms and still sign trade deals with them. We're sure they'll come around, right? That would have been ridiculous. You would have been laughed out of the room. And the same, well, people who say the same thing about Israel should also be laughed out of the room. The UK is still in a cost of living crisis after two years of high inflation and more than a decade of wage stagnation. It's visible everywhere, from supermarket food prices to rents and energy bills. And yet, the Tories have yet again allowed railway fares to rise by eye-watering amounts. On Sunday, fares went up by 4.9% across England and Wales, threatening to put rail travel out of reach for many passengers. The hit will be felt especially hard by commuters for popular commuter routes like Macclesfield to Manchester or York to Leeds. An annual season ticket will now cost almost £150 more. And if you travel regularly between London and Brighton or Canterbury, you could pay close to an extra £300 for a season ticket. The latest fare rises come in the context of an almost 6% hike last year, the largest in a decade, making British rail travel amongst the most expensive in Europe. And rising costs in rail travel aren't just bad for your wallet, they're bad for the environment too. In 2019, Auto Express found that UK peak time rail travel was up to 13 times more expensive than car travel. And research published last year by Greenpeace shows that the price gap between rail and airfares in the UK is the widest among similar economies in Europe. Long-distance rail travel in the UK is now four times more expensive than a flight. In Belgium, France and Italy, it's two and a half times more expensive to travel by rail. Only Poland has the balance right, with rail travel half as expensive as air travel. Rail travel emits only a fraction of the carbon per passenger as air travel, and it's almost always more environmentally friendly to travel by train than by car. So we should be making it easier, not harder, to take a train, and some other countries seem to get that. Last December, National Geographic published an article on why the future of rail travel in the UK looks comparatively bleak. They listed some of the ways other governments are making rail travel more attractive. These include cheap tickets such as Germany's 49 euro pass, a monthly ticket covering most public transport across the country, and Spain's free ticket scheme for short train journeys are signifiers of wider change. So is France's decision to ban short-haul flights on routes where the journey can be made by train in two and a half hours or less. In contrast with the UK, many of Europe's networks are still state-run, and European rail is subsidised to the tune of 73 billion euros a year. Britain's rail companies are, of course, not state-run, they're privately owned, but that doesn't mean they're not state-subsidised. The government paid out £4.4 billion in subsidies to rail companies between March 2022 and 2023. The year before, it was £6.6 billion. Remember, those are private companies. And yet, despite those cash injections from the government and a more than 11% increase in fares over two years, rail companies aren't holding up their side of the bargain. In the year to February, nearly 4% of train services were cancelled in England and Wales. That's just a little below the worst ever recorded figures for cancellation. That was in 2014 when 4.1% of services were axed. So they couldn't blame COVID-19 back then. And obviously, they shouldn't have been able to blame COVID-19 for a while. They do sort of say this this is where um, some of our profits went, so we need more government support. But if you're going to get the government support, you should provide a decent service, which they certainly are not. There is, however, a little bit of good news for some of us. Only some people in Britain get the good news. Um, Sadiq Khan tweeted this today. I was delighted to be at Victoria Station this morning to confirm that TfL fares have been frozen for a year from today. I've made this decision to help Londoners struggling during the cost of living crisis. Millions of Londoners will 
benefit. Ash, if you wanted to sort of, you know, make an argument about the value of public transport being sort of publicly owned and publicly integrated, um, as opposed to being, you know, shipped out to these private franchises, the comparison between public transport in London and basically public transport anywhere else in the country is is a pretty good example to draw from, isn't it? Well, exactly, because while public transport in London isn't perfect, the fact is, is that we've got fairly excellent uh, underground metropolitan services, a hell of a lot better than, you know, if you want to compare to a city like New York. Um, We've got regular buses, which cover much of the city and expansions of bus routes. I mean, that's a pretty good deal. So while it is expensive and, you know, Sadiq Khan has been in this war with central government who've been trying to slash central government funding to try and force him to put fares up and, you know, negatively impact his popularity as a Labour London mayor, we get a pretty good deal. And one of the reasons why is because this is a lot of infrastructure which is in-house. So we're not hemorrhaging money out to shareholders because, look, I'm no economist, but what I do know is this, is that for every pound you pay out to a shareholder, many of whom are actually companies which are based overseas. So the money isn't even staying in the UK. That's money that you're not investing in the service. That's money that you're not investing to bring down ticket prices. There is one more thing that I want to talk about, which is where you have, I think, invisible subsidization of particular forms of transport. And that's with SUVs. So this was a piece of research which came out just recently. If you compare the amount which is being taxed on a brand new SUV in the UK to other European countries, you'll see that it's a complete joke. So if you'd let me read this out, to buy a brand new BMW X5, which is a pretty polluting car, in France, you would be paying €60,000 in tax. In the Netherlands, it's €32,000. In the UK, it's €1,800. Land Rover Discovery in France, that's over €30,000. Netherlands, €26,000. In the UK, it is about €1,200. For a Nissan Qashqai in France, you would be spending €1,172 in tax. In the Netherlands, €8,000 in tax. In the UK, just €294 in tax. So when you compare the amount that we're taxing some of the most polluting and indeed most antisocial forms of transport in the UK compared to other European countries, it shows you what the government's prioritizing. We're perfectly happy for people to buy brand spanking new SUVs, which are polluting to the environment and much more likely to kill your children, rather than putting that money into transport. And it's because with the privatized system, you've got a very inefficient system of investing in transport because you know that a significant chunk of that is going to go straight into the pockets of private shareholders. As the bosses of the Avanti West Coast Line were boasting, it's free money and you don't even have to hit your targets to get it. Taxi SUVs, I like that. Taxi SUVs to pay for much better public transport for everyone. Um, I would back that. I'd put it in, you know, The Labour Manifesto, I'm sure it's going to be a pretty disappointing document, but that could be something you'd put in there. When he was a Labour MP, John Woodcock was on the hard right of the party. He was chair of the Blairite Progress Group until 2015, and between 2011 and 2013, he was chair of Labour Friends of Israel. He was also one of the party's most vociferous opponents of Jeremy Corbyn. In the run-up to the 2017 election, Woodcock said he couldn't vote for his own party, blaming Corbyn's opposition to nuclear weapons. In 2018, Woodcock was back in the news for different reasons. The Barrow MP was suspended from the party after sexual harassment allegations from a former member of staff. At the time, Woodcock said he did not accept the charge, but knew the complaint must be investigated thoroughly. Later that year, he left the party before any investigation was complete, saying he didn't trust the party's processes to not be biased. But sitting as an independent, he still had things to say, like this in 2019. A government that is struggling to govern and a leader of the opposition and shadow chancellor who I am afraid to say I have not changed my view that they are simply not fit to hold high office. The public, Mr Speaker, deserve so much better 
than this choice in the broken political system that they are, be they are being given. They deserve leadership to right the terrible injustices that have been inflicted on our communities. John Woodcock there complained about Britain's broken political system. But he went on to campaign for Boris Johnson to be Prime Minister in 2019 and was then rewarded by Boris Johnson with a peerage. That doesn't sound like fixing Britain's political system to me. It sounds like taking advantage of Britain's fixed political system, right? It's rigged. Woodcock then got another job from Boris Johnson, now with the title Lord Walney. He was appointed as the government's independent advisor on political violence and disruption. It's unclear what Woodcock's qualification for that job was beyond hating the left, but he's now released his long-awaited report on political violence and disruption. And he's summarised his recommendations with an op-ed in The Sun on Sunday. I suppose it's the home of political extremism, so that makes sense. Lord Walney, we must stop thugs threatening democracy and ban MPs working with groups behind Palestine marches. So in the piece, he says this, My review on political violence is about to be formally submitted to the Prime Minister and the Home Secretary. In it, I am asking the leader of every mainstream political party to take a zero-tolerance approach to the menace that is threatening our democracy. So Rishi and Keir should instruct their MPs and councillors not to engage with anyone from the Palestine Solidarity Campaign until they get their house in order and cut the hate from their marches. The same goes for hardline environmental groups like Extinction Rebellion, and just stop oil, whose tactics can be to create illegal disruption to get noticed and get their way. While painting people who want to prevent a genocide in Gaza or tackle the climate emergency as dangerous extremists, John Woodcock's article made no reference whatsoever to the far right. It wasn't mentioned. He was hired to bash the left, and he is going to carry out that job, as I assume Boris Johnson intended. Of the recommendations, the Guardian write this. The proposals are politically convenient for the government because, if accepted, they would put further pressure on the Labour leader over his party's stance on pro-Palestine demonstrations. Several sitting Labour MPs have attended Palestine Solidarity campaign events, including the former Shadow Chancellor John McDonnell and the MP for Poplar and Limehouse, Absana Begum. Labour has refused to suspend MPs who have attended events, despite demands from senior Tories, because the PSC is not a prescribed organisation. Unsurprisingly, Sunak is said to be seriously considering Walney's proposals. Imagine that. You've got an ex-Labour MP, campaigns for the Tories, gets rewarded with a job from the Tories, has now published an incredibly authoritarian set of recommendations that would just, by chance, be incredibly advantageous to the Conservative Party and, you know, disadvantageous potentially for the Labour Party, but obviously very, very damaging for the movement that wants to stop a genocide in Palestine. Oh, and by the way, he used to be chair of Labour Friends of Israel. Ash, is John Woodcock the most dangerous man in Britain? Here's one of the things which I find not funny ha-ha about John Woodcock, but it's one of those mirthless chuckles that you give when you consider the absurdity of the British political system. I don't think you can get a better example of someone who has entered the House of Lords because of a fundamentally broken system. I think that he's the best example you can get of that because, as you said, he's someone on the right of the Labour Party who was being investigated for allegations of sexual impropriety, allegations which he denied, but of course the investigation couldn't be completed because he quit the Labour Party before that could be done. He's rewarded for his attacks on Jeremy Corbyn's leadership with a permanent seat in the House of Lords. He will have that role in Britain's legislature until he dies. And he's seen as some kind of hero in the eyes of much of the press, as a man who takes a bold stance against of extremism and stands up for the politics of the centre. This is a man who stands up for no one but himself. And I have a feeling that one of the reasons why John Woodcock gets such an easy ride from the press is because look at who he's married to. He's married to Isabel Hardman, who is a political journalist. She writes for The Spectator. She's very, very well liked within the lobby. And I'm not saying that she's got any particular reason to be disliked. Every time I've encountered her, she's been perfectly courteous and kind. But I think that that means that John Woodcock gets protected within that political journalism culture of we don't go for one of our own right? Because he's the husband of one of our own. And we really do quite like her. And you know, she's gone through a hard time and she writes very openly about her struggles with depression. So we're not going to go for this man who 
quite simply has been rewarded with a seat permanently in our upper house and has dodged a proper investigation over very serious allegations. So there's something about John Woodcock where even before you get to this role that he's playing, which is trying to curtail legitimate lawful and democratic participation in politics that I just think he is the most perfect emblem of a dysfunctional and corrupt and corroded political system. You think about the role that he's playing now where I think that he's trading on his status as a former Labour MP to give a veneer of liberal progressive cover to what are deeply authoritarian and draconian suggestions. And I think that is something that makes him more dangerous. I mean, look, the targets that he's chosen, Palestine Solidarity Campaign, Extinction Rebellion, these are associated with the left and they're associated with Muslims. Those are, of course, the perennial political targets of the right in this country. Those are the people who are considered to be most politically threatening to the interests of those in power. Not threatening in terms of the actual harm they pose to you know, the population, but political th- politically threatening to the interests of those in power. That's why they went for Jeremy Corbyn. And that's why they're going for these pressure groups now. And you know, if, if we had a political media that was doing its job, I think you would have much more robust scrutiny of John Woodcock, but you don't get that because one, his interests align with the interests of many people in political media, and two, he's married to one of them. Oh, and you want to know the icing on the cake, Michael? Isabel Hardman wrote a book saying, why do we get the wrong politicians? Why do we get so many bad MPs? I was like, girl, the call is coming from inside the house. It's labelled husband. I'm not even going to try and add to what you've said because I think you have put fantastically how John Woodcock sort of represents everything that's wrong with politics in this country. But this is such a dangerous proposal, right? Now, there are moments, you know, sometimes I have disagreements with people in the Navarra office because, for example, you know, when the, if the government talk about saying, oh, we should tighten the law on sort of people blocking roads or whatever, you know, some people think, oh, that's a sign of like creeping fascism. I'm like, well, to be honest, if people are blocking roads, um, you know, it, it's not a sign of fascism to say, we're going to change the law slightly so we can get you out the road quicker. You know, you you agree or disagree. But to me, that's sort of, you know, I think it's within people's right to take direct action. It's within the right of politicians and the public to say, oh, we want to move. We we think we haven't got the balance quite right. This thing that was, you know, somewhat legal, we're going to make a bit more illegal. That kind of stuff is, to me, as I say, you can agree or disagree, but it's not that worrying when sort of disruptive, extremely disruptive protests are somewhat curtailed. But the idea that a politician, a democratically elected politician, shouldn't be able to talk to anyone associated with a political issue or a particular issue is so authoritarian, so authoritarian, right? The idea, if you are an MP, you can't talk to anyone who is part of the biggest movement in this country against, you know, potentially the worst genocide of the 21st century. You can't even talk to them because some people are holding some banners on a demonstration that you don't like. That is so authoritarian. Because also, we need to remember, when people are talking about these demonstrations against a potential genocide in Gaza, they're not disruptive demonstrations. If people were bringing London to a standstill and sort of blocking roads all the time, again, agree with it or disagree with it, but I can see why, you know, you might say, oh, we should change some laws here because people are getting too annoyed that they can't get to their work on time or whatever like that. Disagree or agree, I don't think it's outrageous. But the idea that they're holding banners we don't like, they have political positions we don't like, and therefore they shouldn't be allowed to do a perfectly non-disruptive protest and they should be banned from, or MPs should be banned from speaking to them. That is just completely next level authoritarian, right? And it might, hopefully it's going to be too authoritarian even for this Tory government, because I do think that it it might be the case that lots of people are like, this John Woodcock guy, he is nuts. Right. This, is, this is clearly vindictive, right? He's written an article about political extremists where all he mentions is people he's hated his whole career. People on the left, and as Ash says, Muslims, right? So, I mean, has he, he'd probably dispute, I'm, I'm sure he would dispute that he's hated Muslims his whole career, but he, he clearly hates people um, who are pro-Palestine and want to campaign against a potential genocide by Israel. He was chair of Labour Friends of Israel, right? It's, it's not a surprise that this is happening. This is clearly a politically motivated guy. Um, He does seem to be too extreme for the Labour Party. So the Labour Party has been awful on Palestine and protests, but they aren't quite as reactionary 
as John Woodcock. This was Shadow Education Secretary Bridget Philipson, who was asked um, about John Woodcock's proposals on the BBC. MPs need to take care in terms of uh, the associations that we have with individuals or organisations. But I do think, however, it is important to stress that the right to protest is an important fundamental right in our democracy. That does mean that people will, will take part in marches or protests where politicians might not agree. But that is the beauty of our democracy. That's something that I think is really precious. That was Bridget Philipson being bland but not completely evil. In contrast, Jess Phillips has actually been genuinely good on this. She said this on Sky's Electoral Dysfunction podcast. I don't think it's a fair reflection of reality. I, I, I get As somebody who has faced security threats for uh, now nearly a decade, I mean, this decision, the decisions like that weren't made in, during Brexit because of, of security risks against us. I think making out like it's worse at the moment and this idea of mob rule, I can't help but feel that that's because some of the people who are upset with us at the moment have got brown faces. Like, I don't think that was the speaker making that, but this conversation that's come out of what the speaker did all about oh, security is, I, I, I have to say, I've been a bit shocked by it. That was quite refreshing um, from Jess Phillips. Um, Ash, were you pleasantly surprised by that intervention? I suppose she could have stood up and said it in Parliament, which maybe would have been a bit you know, braver than saying it on a podcast, but you know, it's decent analysis, I thought. Look, you do get politicians saying insightful things when the truth lines up with political expediency. So... It was refreshing, but I think Jess Phillips is also, she's a canny politician. She also knows she's got a you know pretty high percentage of Muslims in her constituency. I think she knew that she would be subject to a, you know, potentially competitive independent run at her seat. And she's been fairly consistent, I think, on the Palestine issue since October the 7th. She, of course, resigned her role in the government so that she could, um, you know, vote in favour of a ceasefire. How much does that reflect her personal beliefs? I mean, it probably does. I think it also lines up with what the political pressures are for her and her politi- in her particular constituency. I think when it comes to Bridget Phillipson, I think that, again, shows you the impact of the Rochdale by-election result and the polling that Labour is getting, suggesting that seats which should be absolutely nailed on for them in the next general election might not be because of how unpopular their positioning over Gaza has been. So I think that that's why you're seeing this, you know, completely rare once in a blue moon phenomenon of politicians speaking the truth. It's because domestic political pressures have spooked them a little bit. Mm, I think that's true. And I mean, it is, you know, because Jess Phillips does have uh, a large proportion of, of Muslims in her constituency. What she doesn't have is a large proportion of radical Islamists. And I think what that speaks to is the fact that when you've got, you know, John Woodcock sort of blowing these dog whistles, etc., people know what he's doing, right? People, ordinary Muslims around the country who care about Gaza know that he is trying to demonize them and trying to categorize them as extremists and trying to clamp down on their rights to be full participants in society. Maybe she genuinely believes it. I think she probably does. You know, she sounded very genuine there, right? But as you say, Ash, I think it's this question of someone's beliefs aligning with political expediency clearly has happened in this case. And that's because Jess Phillips knows that the majority of her constituents, when they sort of see this ridiculous moral panic that's going on, when they hear proposals such as this from John Woodcock, they see it for what it is which is an Islamophobic dog whistle. You know, it's, it's not the case that sort of uh, these things are being said by these right-wing politicians and then you've got the, this tiny minority of extremist radical Islamists in the country sort of saying, oh, damn, they're really going to clamp down on us now. All of these plans that we had to do radical Islamism and to do sort of violent threats against people, this is suddenly going to be stymied by this plan from John Woodcock. Damn, they've got us now. You know, that's not happening Anywhere, what is happening is that ordinary Muslims are saying, "What? The, why? Why are they coming for us again?" And, you know, Jess Phillips recognizes that because you know she's probably a bit more in touch um, with ordinary people in this country than John Woodcock is, sitting in the House of Lords, married to his political journalist, saying, "We need a, we need to fix um, the the British political system while accepting a peerage, while accepting a job from a prime minister who he campaigned for against his own party." Right? Despicable. Um, but yeah, some people are seeing through it. If only um, more people would. And if they said it's you know not just 
on a cosy podcast, but sort of stood up in parliament and said, by the way, this whole thing is ridiculous. Last week saw one of the most shocking single incidents of Israel's war on Gaza. In what's been dubbed the flower massacre, over 100 Palestinians were killed as they tried to acquire flour and food from an aid truck outside Gaza City. This is how the BBC reported the incident at the time. More than 100 Palestinians have been killed while waiting for food aid in Gaza City. These images are from that attack in the southwest of the city. A journalist told the BBC that Israeli tanks opened fire on a crowd who'd come to collect supplies. A large number of people had been gathered waiting for food when the incident happened. The Israeli military issued these aerial pictures of the incident. It says dozens of Gazans were crushed and trampled as they surrounded the aid trucks. Separately, an Israeli source confirmed its troops had fired after feeling threatened by the crowds near the aid point. Let's have a listen to that statement from the Israeli Prime Minister's office. The trucks were overwhelmed and the people driving the trucks, which were Gazan, uh, Gazan civilian drivers, uh, plowed into um, the crowds of people. Uh, ultimately killing, my understanding is, tens of people. Now let's have a listen to an account from a Palestinian who was there. After they stopped shooting, we went back to get our aid. By the time I got flour and some canned goods and took it down from the truck, they shot at us. They shot me and the truck driver left and ran over my leg. I lost my nerves. If you want to get us aid this way, then you might as well not bring anything. So in that clip, you heard a number of different accounts of what happened. At the start, we were told that a Palestinian journalist had told the BBC that Israeli tanks had fired on the crowd. We then heard the Israelis say that most people were killed in either a stampede or by Gazan truck drivers panicking. So the spokesperson said the latter, um, a source to the BBC, had said the former. A Palestinian then says that Israeli troops were shooting people in the crowd. So what really happened? Which account is closest to the truth? Well, you won't be surprised to know the IDF claimed to have carried out an investigation which exonerates their soldiers. This was their spokesperson speaking on Sunday. The IDF has concluded an initial review of the unfortunate incident where Gazan civilians were trampled to death and injured as they charged to the aid convoy. Our initial review has confirmed that no strike was carried out by the IDF towards the aid convoy. The majority of Palestinians were killed or injured as a result of the stampede. From the information we gathered from the commanders and forces on the ground, our initial review has indicated that following the warning shots fired to disperse the stampede and after our forces had started retreating, several looters approached our forces and posed an immediate threat to them. According to the initial review, the soldiers responded towards several individuals. So he said no Israeli strike was carried out, so presumably that would exclude an airstrike or tank fire. He repeated the line that most people were killed in a stampede, and he said, we did shoot some, quote, looters, but it was only in self-defense. Now, parts of that account just sound completely implausible to me, right? It's unclear why looters, so you're a looter, you're going there because you want some food, why would you then approach heavily armed IDF soldiers, right? If, if you're desperately trying to grab flour, would you do a detour and decide to start a fight with the IDF, right? That doesn't make any sense, right? I don't buy that for one moment. The question it's harder to make a sort of snap judgment without seeing the evidence about is whether most people were killed by gunfire or by a stampede. You know, you can't come to a conclusion off the top of your head on that. We know that the Israelis have been very happy to kill civilians en masse. But we also know that due to Israel's genocidal war, Palestinians in Gaza are literally starving, right? There are thought to be 300,000 people without sufficient food or water living in northern Gaza. So it wouldn't be a surprise if the distribution of food aid could become dangerously chaotic. And on that question, BBC Verify has now released this report. What video and eyewitness accounts tell us about Gazans killed around aid convoy? Um, now, in terms of eyewitness accounts, the key ones were this from a journalist who was on the scene. Israelis purposefully fired at the men. They were trying to get near the trucks that had the flour. They were fired at directly 
and prevented people to come near those killed. They also spoke to a doctor at the nearby Al Auda Hospital who told them this. Al Auda Hospital received around 176 injured people. 142 of these cases are bullet injuries and the rest are from the stampede and broken limbs in the upper and lower body parts. The BBC report didn't suggest the hospital had provided visual evidence of this claim, but the Euromed Human Rights Monitor has published a separate report which references a doctor at the separate Al-Shifa Hospital. So in that report, they write this. Dr. Jabala Al-Shafi, head of the nursing department, stated that they observed dozens of dead and injured upon their arrival to Al-Shifa Hospital hit by Israeli gunfire. The doctor also emphasized that all relevant documentation, including x-rays and medical reports, is accessible to the media, human rights groups, or investigative committees. Now, if the hospital follows through on that offer to share all relevant evidence, it would be a huge contrast with Israel's approach. And we know that they have footage of the event because they released some of it. This is some of the infrared drone footage released by the IDF to show crowds surrounding aid trucks. It was released as an attempt to show the IDF were blameless. But the BBC say the video the IDF released was not one single sequence, but had instead been edited into four sections. They say that BBC Verify has asked the IDF for the complete footage of the incident, but so far it has not been forthcoming, right? So we know this footage exists because we've seen part of it, but the IDF hasn't handed over all the footage in an unedited fashion. So it's completely impossible for any journalistic outlet to actually verify what happened. So the evidence is there, but they won't hand it over. Take from that what you will, right? The BBC do, however, isolate a part of the IDF footage which they did release, which could be suggestive of what happened. So in a still from the footage, you can see at least four motionless aid trucks. And so they sort of come to a halt and two Israeli military vehicles. And the BBC also highlighted what they say are motionless bodies presumed to be dead. And three of them appear to be in the line of fire of Israeli vehicles. And seven are on the other side of the aid trucks. Ash, I'm sort of reading through this BBC investigation. I mean, it's called BBC Verify. They they haven't, you know, I, I don't think they've done as full an investigation as might be possible. And they haven't come down sort of particularly strongly on one side or the other. But as is so often the case, in situations such as this, we know Israel has more evidence than it is revealing. So it is selectively revealing evidence, which means I don't really trust what they're saying. And I suppose the big picture here is that however this happened, you were starving 2 million people, right? People are going through hell. They have no food. They're going out to try and get food to bring home to their families and they get killed trying to do it. However they get killed, Israel has responsibility here because they have put this siege on the people of Gaza, right? So, you know, you you could say it doesn't actually matter what happened in this instance because Israel is to blame either way for this humanitarian catastrophe. But I suppose, do you think we've learned anything from this this BBC investigation? I think what we saw with this BBC Verify investigation is an example of low-information journalism masquerading as high-information journalism. So it had all of the aesthetic qualities that you might associate with open source intelligence analysis or something like forensic architecture, but actually none of the practices that go into those kinds of investigations. What you had in terms of how it was presented was, here's a statement from the IDF, here's a statement from a Palestinian, well, here's a still from what Israel released in terms of its footage, and here are the gaps in its narrative. That's not actually a in-depth verification process. It's a sort of an assembly of the Israeli PR case with a little sprinkling of BBC balance. Whereas if you look at the kind of work that goes into a forensic architecture investigation, it's a lot more time consuming, but it's also a lot more thorough. So what you're looking at is um, user generated content, all the kinds of phone footage that you might have from people in a given area. You're putting that together so you can get a real time assemblage of what happened and you're looking at it from the different vantage points and you can assemble a picture of what happened in a particular space in all three dimensions through a particular period in time and then you can contrast it 
to what Israel was saying happened. Now, forensic architecture have done exactly this kind of work, which is looking at the kinds of user-generated video, looking at pattern analysis, looking at open source intelligence, and they've been able to show where Israel has presented a misleading case and there's been a misleading presentation of evidence, for instance, in its submissions at the International Court of Justice. You can't do that kind of work overnight. It is resource intensive and it is highly skilled journalistic work. I couldn't do that work, but that's exactly the kind of journalism that would be adding value in this context. And what's quite shameful about the BBC, it's like they cribbed the aesthetics of it, but none of the actual practices. So this isn't in-depth journalism. It is low quality, low information journalism, but it's masquerading as something a lot more thorough than it is. I think when you look at the flower massacre, as it is being called, there is a lot that lines up with other accounts which are emerging from Gaza. So something which Palestinians, particularly in the north of Gaza, are saying is that even before the flower massacre, they were used to aid distribution being an incredibly dangerous time because that's when they'd be shot at by snipers. And people who went to go and collect food aid did so in the knowledge that they might not come back. So you have Palestinians reporting that they have witnessed bullet injuries, bullet fatalities, that there was one man who had gone to collect flour for his family. He'd been shot and he was trying to hand over the bag of flour to another Palestinian saying, please get this to my five daughters. I'm the only one who's providing anything for them right now. So there is a certain consistency in these accounts of aid being used as an opportunity for further massacres of Palestinians. And for me, this leads us to a really important question about how we understand this war. Um, An interview that will be coming out, I interviewed Major General Charlie Herbert just last Friday, and I asked him about, you know, is it a simple rule of warfare that over a long enough period of time, a homegrown insurgency is always going to defeat an occupying force. And he was like, well, the one thing that we know is that it's impossible to defeat a homegrown insurgency within the norms and legal frameworks of the internationally agreed rules of war. And I think that when you look at what Israel has been trying to do in Gaza, is this an army which is abiding by the rules of war? No, they're not. And rather than looking at all of these instances as individual examples of a breakdown in discipline or the IDF doing something that they shouldn't do, it's actually totally consistent with a state which has decided it has no truck with liberal international norms no truck with the rules of war because what they want to do is something which is basically impossible under those frameworks, which is defeat a homegrown insurgency and an insurgency which is only there because of what you've been doing as a state. So I think understanding that that's what's going on with the IDF makes all of these things a lot clearer. These are not individual uh, breakdowns in discipline. This is what their project of total war is all about. There's a phrase, I mean, I think I've said it on this show before, I think it's from to- the, the historian Tony Jutt, where he says Zionism is a 19th century prob- 19th century project, sorry, in the 20th century. You know, that's the, the fundamental problem um, for, for Israel. You know, if you're looking at it from their terms, not necessarily from sort of neutral moral terms, but from their terms, is it's an ethno-nationalist project that came too late, right? If, if they'd done this in the, in the 19th century, they could have just cleared the whole land and made it their own. Right. And then they'll say, oh, yes, we did some terrible things in the past, but we're sorry now. You know, maybe you have a day of remembrance where, you know, like, like they do in, in, in North America when it comes to Native Americans. You know, it's, it's like, oh, we did this bad thing in the past, but we've moved on. Israel are trying to do that, but in the 20th century when norms have changed. And that's been sort of why they haven't been able to complete the project of settler colonialism, essentially. And I think, you know, what you're saying, Ash, is very consistent with the idea that they are saying, okay, well, this is a 19th century project in the 21st century, but we're going to have to fight a 19th century war, which means using tactics which are now seen as 
taboo, right? They'll obviously dress it up in sort of 21st century language, but what are they actually doing is they are trying to, yeah, you know, do a genocide of a people whose land they want, which is a very 19th century thing to do. Um, Ash, let's wrap up there on that incredibly grim note. Um, thank you for all of your incredibly insightful interventions this evening. Well, thank you for having me. It's good to be back. And thank you all for tuning in. Come back tomorrow for another stream. You've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.